Focus on value. Only value is sustainable. People used to ask me like, oh, how do you get rid of the negative voice? And I'm like, I don't know that you want to. Mm. Like the negative voice is a powerful reminder to practice gratitude. It's, it's also a good reminder that maybe something is wrong. Maybe you are doing something wrong and you should adjust and you should rethink. The thing that I probably repeat to myself the most is you can do anything you set your mind to on a long enough timeline. So I know I can learn anything. Need motivation? Watch a top 10 with Believe Nation. Top 10, I got a top 10. Got my motivation high for my top 10. Gotta learn from the wise women and men. All my life. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and I make these videos because chances are you are the most ambitious person in your circle, but you know you're capable of more. And you get that push by surrounding yourself with the best. So today, let's learn from one of the best, Tom Bilyeu, and my take on his top 10 rules for success. Enjoy. Okay, let's kick it off with rule number one, focus on value. Focus on value. Only value is sustainable. You want to make sure that you're delivering value at every touch point. Your customer service should deliver value. Your marketing message should deliver value. Your advertising in and of itself should deliver value. Your ads should be served to the people who even though they can skip it after four seconds, they don't. That's when you're actually delivering value. Rule number two, utilize your negative voices. People used to ask me like, oh, how do you get rid of the negative voice? And I'm like, I don't know that you want to. Mm. Like the negative voice is a powerful reminder to practice gratitude. It's, it's also a good reminder that maybe something is wrong. Maybe you are doing something wrong and you should adjust and you should rethink. I was just about to say that sometimes your negative voice is what protects you. Yeah. Sometimes, yeah. Very, not all the time, but there can be times when it's protected. In fact, I'll say it like this. It, it probably does protect you all of the time, but it's so repetitive that you touch this issue and now we're into the 9,000th replay of this, that's where it becomes stupid. And so the one thing, yep, cool, got it, I do need to work on that, you're absolutely right. Um, and then just letting it go, right? Mm. And not clinging onto it, not beating yourself up over it and all that stuff. But it, yeah. it, it has a use, which is why it's so powerfully with us. Rule number three, work hard. The man on top of the mountain didn't fall there. It's so tempting to look at people that have achieved the extraordinary and dismiss them as being more talented than you, better than you. But what you need to see is the simple truth. They've worked harder than you. They've earned something that you haven't yet earned. But here's the great news. That's empowering. Once you understand that they've just busted ass, once you understand that they've just put in an inhuman amount of work and that the only thing that distinguishes the people that are on top of the mountain, the people that have really done something that's going to last, is that they put in the effort. They work on themselves. They understand that through discipline and effort over time, that we can get better. That is the human condition. That is the thing that I find most beautiful about being a person is it doesn't matter if you're bad today. It doesn't matter where you start. It only matters where you're willing to go and the price that you're willing to pay to get there. And once you buckle down and you assure yourself and back it up with action that you're willing to pay any price to achieve the things that you want to achieve, then you'll really be living a limitless life. Rule number four, find your why. Elon Musk talks about in his business, it's all about breaking things down to the physics. If you sell the people, the physics in your world is psychology and understanding what motivates them. So your company needs to have a why. If you know Simon Sinek and his brilliant book, Start With Why, you'll know what we're talking about, the golden circle. Most people know what they do. They may even know how they do it, but they oftentimes don't know why they do it. Why did we launch Quest Nutrition? Because we wanted to end metabolic disease. Now, nobody knew that from looking at a protein bar, but our marketing material was about that. We didn't do features and benefits. We said, stop sacrificing. We said, you should hold food companies to a new standard. It's ridiculous that food companies aren't engineering new equipment to make food that's both good for you and delicious. It's just ridiculous. Nobody's held their feet to the fire. 
People have been buying the same junk products for years. They're not going to change unless you force them to. And so we came along and said, we're going to be the bearer of standards. We know why we're doing what we're doing. So I can't release a product that has sugar in it. Why? Because that's not going to end metabolic disease. And that is my driver. I show up to work every day not thinking about making it rain and counting my money. I'm not swimming in it like Scrooge McDuck. I'm coming every day thinking about two people, my mom and my sister. And I ask a very simple question. Is this advantageous for my mom and my sister, yes or no? If it is, I do it. If it's not, I don't. Now, a lot of times, what's advantageous for my mom and my sister was really expensive. It was super annoying to have to do it because it was like you watch a profit margins like, oh God. But it becomes an easy filter and every business has to have a filter. Every business needs to know what they say yes to and what they say no to. And if you don't have that blinding guiding light, when you scale, you will fall apart. And the reason you will fall apart, your customers won't know who you are. They won't know how to communicate your message to somebody else. Your employees won't know who you are. They won't know what to communicate to each other, let alone the outside world. So it has got to be blinding. You have to be able to write it down. It has to be super clear. It's got to be direct and it's got to be meaningful. And it has to be real. It's got to actually be something that drives you. All right, what is up everybody? I want to talk to you about my good friend, Evan Carmichael's book right here, Built to Serve. I'm actually gonna read you a section. There are some amazing parts of this book, and this is one of my favorite. It's under the title, Comfort is the Enemy of Greatness. And it goes, when you're comfortable, you don't get strong. When you have plenty of fresh air and no adversity, you crumble as soon as something gets hard. It's rarely the kids of rich parents who go on to do great things, even though they have all the advantages that money, connections, and education can buy. Why is that? Because they're too comfortable. People who are comfortable don't create great things. There it is, Evan Carmichael, bringing the heat in his book, Built to Serve, get a copy. Rule number five, focus on acquisition of skills. What we all have to understand is at the end of the day, the only thing that matters is how good is your product. Whether you're trying to build a company or you're trying to be a kick-ass employee or you're trying to be the best parent of all time, at the end of the day, the only thing that matters is getting good. The only thing that matters is actually delivering an extraordinary performance. Until you get to that point where you can actually knock it out of the park, until you get to the point where you can captivate people with what you're able to do, you haven't gotten anywhere. If you wanna be great, if you wanna leave a legacy, if you wanna be remembered, you've gotta focus on the acquisition of skills. You have to focus on actually getting good. That's the only thing that's really going to capture people's imagination. Rule number six, define terms. We all come to a relationship with like expectations about how we think people should act. And unfortunately, we don't recognize our expectations as expectations, we recognize them as truth. This is how the world is, it is how the world should be. And when somebody, we think that they have those same beliefs and values and rules and all that. And so given this scenario, there's only one way to act that is certainly obvious. And so when the person doesn't act like that, we take it personally, like, whoa, do you not respect me? Do you not love me? Do you not care about me? And it just isn't that. They have a different set of beliefs and rules. There's enough nuance difference that they're not, if they're intending to hurt you, you have a whole different set of problems. But assuming that they're not intending to hurt you, then you have a communication problem. So Lisa and I actually define our terms. Mm -hmm. So we have a few words in our um, marriage that they mean something. So if I say, hey baby, it's important to me that you leave that you know, glass of water on the table, then there, she just wouldn't move it, period. Simple as. Like the, the word important like comes in all caps with exclamation points glowing red. Like that's like when we say it, like it's a drop whatever you're doing, like it's important that you do X, Y, or Z. Now the big thing is when you define a word like that, you can't ever abuse it. So like, I would never say it's important to me that you leave the, you know, it's gotta be it's just extraordinary. Like how many times do I tell her something's important in a year? I don't know, six, seven wow. times in a year? Wow. So it's like, it's really gotta be limited. And then another one is promise. If I say, I promise I'm gonna do that, dude, I'm going to do that. Like there's no two ways about it. So you never throw around promise ever under any circumstance. <laughs> and so dude, it's like, you really, really have to be hardcore. And so, and the other way that we use promise is um, if, if uh, she says, you know, how does this dress look on me? I'm like, yeah, it looks great. And she's like, you promise? 
Then it's like, all right, all right, it makes you look fat. What can I say? You know what I mean? It's like, but then you you cut to like the chase on something. Now the thing is, you can't say that all the time. You can't be like, how's this dress make me look? Fine, promise. Uh, what do you think of this dinner? You like it? Yeah, I love it. Promise. Like if you're doing that, it loses everything. Totally. But if you're saving it for like, in fact, God, I almost don't remember the last time I asked Lisa to promise something like that. Um, but you know that you haven't. We certainly use it more in the early days of our marriage, but even then, like how many times a year? Three or four? I mean, it's like, but it, it really forces you to respect these things that you make sacred in your relationship. Rule number seven, acknowledge your ability to adapt. For the person who's stuck, for the guy or gal who's in the cubicle, who hates their job, is in a dysfunctional relationship, is in debt, whatever the case may be, desperately wants a way out, a way forward, a lifeline, where does that process begin for you? Like, what is the advice that you give that person? So it begins with believing or acknowledging that humans are the ultimate adaptation machine. So the, the thing that has made us the apex predator is not that we're stronger. Um, it's not even that we're smarter. In fact, the, the quote often attributed to Darwin is that, oh, it's the survival of the fittest. He actually didn't say that. Uh, what he did say was, it's not the strongest of the species that survive, nor the most intelligent, but rather the most adaptive to change. Now, the reason that humans are the apex of all apexes is because we are the most adaptive species to change. So if you know that, then it becomes infinitely less important who you are today. And what matters is, who do you want to become? And what price, and the price being the time and energy that you're going to put into acquiring the skills to become that person. So imagine the person that you want to be, how would they act? And then start acting like that. If the person that you want to be would leave their job and you know, regardless of whether they had a safety net, burn the ships and go after something new, then that's what you should do. If the person that you want to be would start working nights and weekends because they very much value having a stable income that they can provide for their family or themselves, whatever, but are going to be disciplined and spend nights and weekends to get the skill set to go be more valuable somewhere else or to start their own company, whatever, then do that. Rule number eight, build connections. Social media is going to allow you to have real, meaningful relationships with your customers. I will tell you one very fast. In the very early days of Quest, when all of us had to go out and actually make the bars, I'm out making bars, our chief marketing officer's out making bars, like everybody's out there. There would be periods of time where we wouldn't respond to somebody on Facebook. But this one woman started responding. And we thought, wow, that's so weird. Like, is did somebody create a fake account? Like, is that one of you guys? And everyone's like, no, man, we didn't do that. That's a real person. And she would tell people like, oh, don't worry. I'm sure they'll get back to you quickly. They're a really great company. And we were so, and this is like early 2010. We're like, what is happening? And so we reached out and said, hey, we want to put you on payroll. She's like, I don't want to be on payroll. And I'm like, whoa, okay, now I'm getting freaked out. Like, what do you want? And she was like, I just want you to continue to deliver a service. I'm a nutritionist and I use your bars with a lot of people. I just want to make sure that you're around. So we developed this really cool relationship with her. We all got to know her. She held us to a standard. She was not always nice. She was always fair, but she wasn't always nice. If we were doing something poorly from a product standpoint, like we, weights and measures will let you ship product that's heavy. You just can't ship light. Okay, so imagine you get your bag of Doritos, your bag of Doritos is gonna be heavy, it's never gonna be light. Now, so we're thinking, okay, cool, we have to comply with weights and measures, but we're a health and fitness company. So people are like, if I'm buying 60 grams and that's what I have in my diet plan, I wanna make sure I'm eating 60 grams and not 65. And so she would call us out on it. So we ended up buying a piece of equipment because of that relationship that we had with this woman that we'd never met. And then one day she went silent. We wrote to her mom, hey, is everything okay? And her mom said she passed away. She was like 28. And I got like really emotional. And I'd never met her. And I'm not like that guy, but I got legitimately emotional. And I wrote a manifesto. And I said to everyone in the company, basically, we exist to serve these people. Every one of them is trying to do something that we may know nothing about and they're using our products. And so we started celebrating her. Her name's Joy Ramita. We've been doing it for four years now. The Joy Ramita Superfan Award. We bring somebody in that's been amazing to the community. We just give them a big blowout party at our headquarters, give them behind the scenes access to cool stuff just to say thank you. And that's when we really realized it, 
it may not be the kind of relationship you have with your mom or your brother or your sister or your spouse, but it's meaningful, man, in a way that business relationships haven't been since like the local general store and you saw the same people come in every day. It really is like if you can flip that switch in your mind and see it as something beautiful, I'm telling you, it will open you up to a whole new way of interacting with your customers because there's a lot of amazing stuff going on in your communities that you may not even know about or that you could really feed into and build into something amazing. And if you stay focused on it being a community of people that are supporting themselves, each other, and your company, then you can do some pretty incredible things. Rule number nine, be honest. Being honest, even when it sucks, because let me tell you how many times it's gonna be where if you just lied, oh God, it would be so much easier and you would probably get away with it. And, but it, the way that I explain lying to people is you get away with it 50% of the time. And so it tempts you to think it's a good strategy. Hmm. But the other 50% of the time, it is cratering trust. And once you can't trust the person, all hope is lost. And there's nothing more beautiful than being in a relationship with somebody who makes you feel like they're your number, they're number one and that you totally trust them. And Lisa wrote this um, Instagram post about how she could see a photo of me with my arm around a woman or resting my head on I a woman that. or hugging her or whatever. And she, it wouldn't even make her radar to question it. So, that's the fun for us, is having that level of trust. Now, it's like, um, I think it's Buffett that said, you spend your entire life building your reputation, only takes five seconds to lose it. So it's like, we're so careful. We, for 18 years, we've been earning trust with each other. So like, dude, so especially when I was back at Quest, and it was, women would come and flirt and hit on me because they wanted something, wanted to be sponsored by the company or whatever. And I was around bikini, literal bikini models like all the time. And so if ever there was gonna be a moment of insecurity for my wife, it would have been that period. A, she wasn't insecure and B, I, the thought of throwing away 18 years of shared experience of all that trust and everything, it's sex is like rad and super exciting and I love it the most, but like, Compared to what I would have to give up for something like that, it just doesn't rate on the radar. So, and by the way, thing, something like I'm saying now, which most people would hide from their spouse, oh, that yeah, of course I find other people attractive. What are you talking about? Like, we just openly talk about that. Like, she'll nudge me and be like, oh my God, don't you think she's hot? It's like, that's just, we set up early on in the relationship to be aggressively ourselves. And one thing that we both were really honest about was, I was like, look, it is human nature. You are going to find other guys attractive. And I will actually trust you more if you admit when you find somebody attractive than if you say something stupid like, I only have eyes for you. <laughs> oh, really? You're the only human in all of history to like, uh, you know, transcend their human nature? Like, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, yeah. And then that's a super fragile place to be because what happens if I get older? What happens if I get injured or scarred? Like, then I'm really supposed to believe that suddenly you're more attracted to somebody with a scar than somebody without, like, it doesn't make sense. So we all live in this fragile bubble of, well, as long as they lie to me, it's okay. And as long as I'm willing to believe, and even though secretly I know it's a lie, and then it's the more pious than now, like, oh my God, she's thinking all these nice things about me, but I'm actually finding other people attractive and I'm just lying about it. And so then you're like, wait, if I'm lying about it, is she lying about it? And so it just, it erodes all that trust. So from the jump, we were like, look, you're gonna find other people attractive, I'm gonna find other people attractive. But let me introduce you to this magical word called commitment. Now I'm with you because I love you, because I respect you, but I'm also with you because I'm committed to you. And so you don't have to worry that I'm gonna be looking over my shoulder for a more attractive woman. There are gonna be more attractive women than you, for sure, especially as you age. Who the f cares? Mm. You're my wife. We have shared an experience, we've shared a life, we've built this around each other, and commitment means something to me, going back to having that code that you live mm. by, and the rules and the code that I live by, I'm never gonna betray that. Yeah. So it's like, we've always said, I may break up with you one day, because I'm not saying that like, oh, there's nothing you could do that would make me break up with you, for sure there is, but I'm never gonna cheat on you, I may come and say, I'm breaking up with you because I'm gonna go have sex with somebody else, but I'm absolutely not going to go have sex with somebody behind your back, never gonna happen. Mm -hmm. So like having that trust and knowing who the other person is, like all that stuff is, is super meaningful. And look, there's just more and more and more stuff, but those are some big ones. And rule number 10, the last one before a very special bonus clip is believe in yourself. How do you process issues? How do you, do you have a system on what you go through? Something happens, something comes up, 
in your brain? Is there a step process you go through? Yes. What is it? Starts with a goal. So what is my goal? Um, well, first it starts with clearing the emotion because probably whatever sure. I was told just had some emotion. I recenter myself. Uh, the thing that I probably repeat to myself the most is you can do anything you set your mind to on a long enough timeline. So I know I can learn anything. So if the thing that hits me is overwhelming because I'm scared, I don't know how to do it, you can do anything you set your mind to. So at the end of this thinking through is gonna be the question, are you the willing foundation. to set your mind to it yeah. or not? Um, and then I identify, okay, what's my goal? Does this move me towards my goal, yes or no? I think through the process of, has somebody done it? Is there already a well-laid path from where I'm at to actually completing mm -hmm. this? Which is how I decided that we were gonna take on Disney because looking at the only studio ever in the history of time to be disciplined enough to only tell one kind of story from a thousand different angles, so much so that they gave birth to Americana, is Disney. No other studio. Everyone else is all over the map. If I say I'm going to go see a Sony movie or a Paramount movie, you don't know anything about it. But if I say I'm going to go see a Disney movie, you already know something. So their name brand means something. So I could see, oh, there's a path from where I'm at to the impact that I want to have. So I throw that out just as a reminder of, of the path that I'm walking more than I have some particular obsession with Disney. Fascinating. And by the way, in your, in your mind, do you see it already, that vision becoming a reality? No question. No question. No question about it. For sure. And look, I have days of where I'm like, how the f am I actually yeah. going to do this? But then you come back to, you can learn anything you set your mind to, so just keep marching forward. Now I've got a very special bonus clip that I think you're going to enjoy. But before that, it's time for the question of the day. I want to know, what was your single biggest takeaway from this video and your plan of action for the next week? When you get motivated, inspired, you have a 35% chance of following through. But when you get motivated, inspired, and you create a plan of action, you have a over 90% chance of following through. And when you share it with other people, it jumps to 95% chance your likelihood of following through. And so I want that to be you from this video. We don't just watch videos here at Believe Nation. We do something, we take action. So I wanna know your single biggest takeaway from this video and your plan of action for the next week. Leave it down in the comments below because I wanna celebrate you. I applied to USC but didn't realize you had to apply to USC film school separately. So I get into USC but I have terrible SAT scores. I took a 990 or I took it twice and I got a 990 combined score. It's terrible. They do it differently now so people uh, don't realize just how bad yeah, that score that was. That sucks actually. That, that was <laughs> atrocious. Yeah. And so when I looked at the film school it required a 1300. And so I was like whoa how am I supposed to get in? I go see the school counselor at USC and they say Listen, Tom, stop, because I was taking film classes, the general education mm. classes. They said, immediately, stop taking those classes. You are not going to get into film school. Not words like that, those words. They said, statistically speaking, you're more likely to get into Harvard Law than you are to get into USC film school. The number of people that apply is ungodly. The number of slots are tiny. You're not going to get in. You're going to end up spending a fifth year here because you will have wasted your time. And I said, okay. Um, I'm going to get in. Thank you very much, the stubbornness in me. So if you say I can't, I'm going to. And I said, there's got to be a way to figure this out. And I found out that one of the teachers that was on the admissions committee would let you join him for lunch. So I joined him for lunch. And as much as I can't believe this, no one else did. It was just me. Mm. And so I'm sitting down with him and I'm like, all right, look, dude, here's the situation. I want to get into film school, but I got a 990 in my SATs. He was like, Tom, what does SAT stand for? And I said, um, scholastic aptitude test? He's like, that's correct. It's meant to tell me how well you're gonna do in college. So there are two admissions periods. One is you're coming into college, in which case I care deeply about your SATs. And then the other is as an incoming junior. He said, you've already missed the freshman window. So your SATs don't matter anymore. What I wanna see is how good of grades can you get? Because that tells me how well you're actually doing in college. He said, I don't care if you're already a good filmmaker. We want to make you a good filmmaker. I just need to know you know how to learn. So he said, get good grades. So I locked myself in my dorm for the next two years. I didn't drink. I didn't party. I didn't date. I didn't do anything but study. And I studied like a beast. And at the end of those two years, I either had a four point or like a three, nine, five, something crazy. And so I got into film school. Mm. So now I'm like, all right. I told you I was going to get in. I got in, and I did it in a clever way. I went and asked the guy what I had to do. He told me. I did it for two years. I was crazy disciplined, and it worked, man, and I'm here. 
there are three production classes that you have. You've got a 290, a 310, and you crew a 480, which is a senior thesis film. So I do my 290s. They're pretty good. I start getting attention for my filmmaking. So in 290, people are like, wow, this kid, he's kind of one to watch. Because my, two, my 290s were so good, for 310, you have to partner with somebody. Now, you have to either be a director or a cinematographer. Now, needless to say, everybody wants to be a director. Mm-hmm. But then if you're not going to be a director, or sorry, if you're going to be a director, you want to get the best cinematographer. And so what ends up happening is the people that can't get a cinematographer end up being cinematographers. So a lot of times like people sort of make do. I wanted to be a director, and one of the other best directors wanted to be a cinematographer. So now everybody wanted him as their cinematographer, and he chose me. So now I've been one to watch in 290. I get the ideal partner for 310, and we kill our How'd you get that guy? Um, he thought I was talented, fun to be around, and that I was one to watch. And so in terms of I would be a good person to partner with in order to yeah. get a good 480. So partners with me and we kill it. And we don't make the classic mistake that most uh, student filmmakers make, which is to tell a feature-length film as a you know silent right. film. So we told a very short moment in time as a silent black and white film where you wouldn't expect people to talk anyway, so it didn't feel like a silent film. So... People love it, does very well. We both get top level crewing positions on a 480. We both crush that. And both of us actually end up getting selected. Only four people get chosen for a 480. And we both got selected to direct a 480. So now I go from you're never getting into film school, kid. You're more likely to get into Harvard Law than USC film to being one of only four people to not only get in, but direct a senior thesis film. So, right? I'm killing it. Tom, what are you talking about? You failed a film school, baby. You did everything. You were one to watch. And I was like, man, I'm making it. I'm going to graduate. I'm going to get my three-picture deal. This is going to be amazing. I'm naturally talented. I knew it. Everything has proven to me that I have natural talent as a filmmaker. Fixed mindset all day, but who cares, baby? Because I got the talent. Then I go into the 480 as a director, and I f*** it up. And I crash and burn so spectacularly that people are taking snippets of my film and cutting them into what we would now call memes. Oh, but no. at the time, was just like mean to be funny. And they would like screen it in front of the class. People would be pissing their pants with laughter because it was so bad. And I was having like basically an emotional breakdown. And I call my mom from the middle of uh, the school. I'm laying on the ground on a payphone. And I'm like, my life is over. And I'm going to graduate now from film school with no senior thesis that I can show anybody. And this is a, a point in filmmaking. There's no like digital filmmaking. No one's ever made a film on digital before. That doesn't exist. If you want to shoot a film minimum for a no budget film is $100,000, that might as well have been $100 million. So I graduate. I steal my master, by the way, which I still have because it is that bad. I know when people uh-huh. hear this story, they just think I'm being humble. I'm telling you, you just like put my it on SATs, YouTube. N- yeah, over my dead body oh come on like everybody everybody has told that the story. one thing i've told the story many yeah. times i don't i think my wife has seen it but only once so yeah over my dead body the thing will never uh-huh. be seen although I, I have to admit like at some point maybe it'd be cool to show when once i have something that i'm that i've done that i'm proud of i might show it um, but you could make that part when you give when you give uh presentations to show a clip of it yeah you're absolutely you know? right anyway so sorry, i interrupted I, you no not at all so I steal the master because it's that bad and I never want people to see it. And I graduate and now I feel lost. And I'm like, I'm never going to break in. My life is, like I had one shot. I actually made it and I totally messed it up. And so it's over. I'm never going to be a filmmaker. And that was my identity. I was a filmmaker. And so now that was gone. And I was like, wow, I don't know what to do. And so I was sliding towards depression. I would lay on my the floor of my unfurnished apartment because I couldn't afford to furnish it. And I remember the feeling of the vinyl carpet smashing into my face because I would just lay there for an hour, two hours at a time. And I was like, yep, my life is over. I don't know what to do. I'm sliding towards depression. And thankfully, I started reading about the brain to avoid sliding towards depression. So now there are two ways to look at my film career. One is, dude, against all odds, you became through hard work and discipline, not because anything was given to you. People told you you would never do it. And you worked and worked and worked, and you got it, and you did it, and you were one of the four people selected to do a 480. And the amount, even though your 480 wasn't good, the amount that you learned from that 480 transformed you not just as a filmmaker, as a human being, and became one of the most transformative, revolutionary things that set you up. That's real. That story is there in what you just heard. The other story is, 
you got arrogant, you got cocky, you believed you were the next John Woo, that you could roll up on set, that you were naturally gifted, you didn't have to work, so you hardly broke your script at all. You like, I wrote the script in like an hour before having to turn it in to be considered. I never touched it again until the first day of shooting, didn't storyboard, nothing. Just rolled up and thought, I'll know where to put the camera, it'll all just feel instinctive and and intuitive. And so I went and nothing was working, it was all garbage, my crew didn't believe in me, the film was falling apart, teachers tried to save me but couldn't get through to me because I was so convinced, I know what I'm doing, and it just turned into a pile of garbage because I have no talent. Now, both of those scenarios are true. It is true that at that time I did not have talent. Now, it doesn't mean I couldn't develop skill, but I didn't have talent. Mm-hmm. So which, do you, which story do you repeat to yourself? For the first probably two years after I graduated, I repeated the I'm not talented story. Then I began read, reading about the brain and realized, oh, I just haven't developed skills yet. And so then I began to change the story and to focus on the discipline and all the things that I'd learned and all that. But both are true. And so what I tell people is, because you're more likely to believe something negative, don't even worry about what's true. Worry about what empowers you. When it comes to just yourself, I'm not talking about you know, uh, f- uh, uh, fake news or you know, a post-truth world. Mm. I'm just saying for yourself. <clears throat> both of those narratives are based on facts. So the truth of one or the other doesn't matter. One is empowering and one is disempowering. Act in accordance with the one that's empowering. If you want 10 more amazing rules from Tom Bilyeu, check out the video right there next to me. I think you'll enjoy it. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there. The single most important part in learning to be honest with yourself is to accept that you must have self-esteem. And the problem is most people build their self-esteem around something stupid. So 